Hello and welcome to week four, part one of EGM 703, SAR Missions and Data. In this lesson, we'll learn a bit more about SAR data, including some commonly used SAR missions and where we can find those data. In the rest of this week, we'll look at applications of SAR data before learning about INSAR and its applications and finish up by looking at applications of passive microwave remote sensing. Just like we've seen with the visible portion of the electromagnetic spectrum, or the infrared, we can also divide the microwave portion of the electromagnetic spectrum into different bands based on their wavelengths or frequencies. The most common ones that we'll run into in order of decreasing, increasing wavelength or decreasing frequency are K-band, which is often divided into Ka, K, and Ku, ranging from about 40 to 12 gigahertz or about 1.5 to 11.1 .1 centimeters. Then we have X-band ranging from 12 to 8 gigahertz or about 2.5 to 3.75 centimeters, followed by C-band ranging from 8 to 4 gigahertz or about 3.75 to 7.5 centimeters, S-band which ranges from 4.2 giga 4 to 2 gigahertz or 7.5 to 15 centimeters. L-band from 2 to 1 gigahertz or 15 to 30 centimeters, and then finally P-band which ranges from about 1 gigahertz to 300 megahertz or about 30 to 100 centimeters. Each of these different bands has different applications. For example, K-band is not commonly used for satellite-based remote sensing owing to an absorption of water vapor at approximately 22.5 gigahertz or 1.35 centimeters. Different frequencies or wavelengths have different penetration into vegetation, snow and ice, or other surfaces owing to the dielectric properties of those surfaces. We can see the example here showing how X-band primarily gives us information about the tops of forest canopies, Longer wavelengths like L-band or P-band give us quite a bit of information about the canopy and the tree structure. Ionospheric effects, like we introduced last week, tend to increase with wavelength, which can have implications for spaceborne P-band radar systems. As we're going to see through the rest of this lesson, the X, C, and L bands are by far the most popular choices for satellite-based microwave remote sensing, though there are currently plans for a spaceborne P-band sensor currently in the works. Generally speaking, we can divide the ways that SAR sensors acquire images into three main modes, though specific sensors will have their own variations on these basic themes. The first mode that we'll look at is strip map mode. This is the most basic acquisition mode where the radar is imaging a single swath parallel to the satellite orbit. This is the mode that we discussed last week when we introduced the concept of synthetic aperture radar. Recall that the range resolution of the sensor depends on the frequency range of the chirp that is sent out by the transmitter, while the azimuth resolution in this mode depends on the length of the synthetic aperture, which depends on the length of the physical antenna. Next up, we have spotlight mode, where the beam of the sensor is actually steered forward or backward in order to the extend the amount of time that the sensor looks at a particular spot on the ground. In this mode, the range resolution still depends on the frequency range of the chirp sent out by the transmitter, but the length of the synthetic aperture, and therefore the azimuth resolution, is no longer dependent on the length of the physical antenna. In effect, we're able to increase the azimuth resolution of the sensor by spending longer looking at a particular spot on the ground. However, this requires a trade-off with spatial coverage, because we're not able to image the areas directly before or behind the area that we're highlighting. Finally, we have the ScanSAR mode. In this mode, the satellite sends out multiple bursts in order to scan progressive subswaths on the ground. With, with this, we get increased coverage or a wider swath than we otherwise would, but we lose a little bit of azimuth resolution because the sensor doesn't spend quite as long looking at a particular point on the ground. But, as always, the range resolution only depends on the frequency range of the chirp that is sent out by the transmitter. 
So the first SAR mission that we'll cover is the European Remote Sensing Satellite, or ERS. And as you can see from the diagram here, ERS had a number of different sensors, including a microwave sounder, a radar altimeter, and a scatterometer. For now, we're going to focus on the SAR sensor. The ERS SAR instrument operated at 5.3 gigahertz, or 5.6 centimeters wavelength, meaning that this was a C-band radar. ERS only operated in strip map mode with vertical polarization. The VV here means that the transmitter sends out a vertically polarized signal and records a vertically polarized signal. It had a swath width of about 100 kilometers or so and a ground resolution of about 8, 25 meters. Normally, it had a 35-day repeat cycle, meaning that the satellite acquired an image from the same location in its orbit every 35 days. ERS-1 was operative from 1991 until 2000, but it overlapped for quite a while with ERS-2, which was an identical satellite with identical sensors. ERS-2 operated from 1995 to 2011, and from 1995 to 1996, it operated in a tandem mode with ERS-1, meaning that it was requiring images with one day separation using a technique that we'll cover later this week. This means that we can use these images for interferometry. ERS data are all available online from ESA, the European Space Agency, for free from the link here. All you need to do is create a free account. And using your NASA Earth Data account, if you have one of those, you can also get a subset of ERS data, also for free, from the Alaska Satellite Facility. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later on. The next set of missions that we'll cover is RadarSat. RadarSat-1 operated at 5.3 gigahertz or 5.6 centimeters wavelength, making this another C-band radar. It operated in a variety of both strip map and scansar modes. You can see a diagram here showing the different modes and the different beam angles. It recorded horizontally polarized signals, and it had a swath width that varied between 45 and 500 kilometers and a resolution between 8 and 100 meters, depending again on the particular acquisition mode. The temporal resolution of RadarSat-1 was a 24-day repeat cycle, and it was in operation from 1995 until 2013. You can get RadarSat-1 data from a few different places. Natural Resources Canada has a collection of over 36,000 scenes that are freely available, and they have more that they have not yet processed. RadarSat-2 is similar to RadarSat-1 in that it's a C-band radar with horizontal polarization, but it has even more modes, a finer swath width, and potentially higher resolution depending on the acquisition mode. It was first launched in 2007, and it is still operational today. Finally, we have the RadarSat Constellation mission, which is a set of three twin satellites that have the same specifications as RadarSat-2, but the fact that there are three satellites means that there are more acquisitions, greater potential for high temporal repeats, and even better opportunities for topographic mapping. This mission was launched in 2019, and each satellite is expected to operate for at least seven years. Moving away from the C-band radars for a bit, we'll take a look at a few L-band radars operated by the Japanese Aerospace Exploration Agency, or JAXA. I don't have it on the slide here, but JAXA also operated an L-band radar before this on Fuyo-1, which is better known as JERS-1 or J-E-R-S-1, which was in operation from 1992 until 1998. PALSAR, the Phased Array Type L band synthetic aperture radar, operated at 1270 MHz or 23.6 23 centimeters. It had a few different strip map and scansar modes, and this is the first sensor that we've seen that acquired cross-polarized signals. That is, that it operated both a horizontally and vertically polarized transmitter, and also acquired and cross-polarized. So the vertical transmission and the horizontal rec uh, receiving, horizontal transmission and vertical receiving. This means that it provides a bit more information about the surface characteristics that we're observing. It operated on a swath width between 20 and 350 kilometers, 
with a spatial resolution between 10 and 100 meters, again depending on the mode. It had a much longer repeat cycle than we've seen so far at 46 days, and it was in operation from 2006 until early 2011. Palsar 2 is an upgraded version of Palsar with a higher spatial resolution and temporal resolution. It was launched in 2014 and it is still operational today. You can get Palsar data from the Alaska Satellite Facility's Vertex archive, which is linked here. The entire Pulsar archive, not including Pulsar 2, is freely available with your NASA Earth data login. Changing frequencies once again, we'll take a look at Terrasar X and Tandem X, which are operated by the German Aerospace Agency, DLR. Terrasar X operates at 9.65 gigahertz or 3.1 centimeters, so this is an X-band radar, as you can hopefully guess from the name. Terrasar X operates in a number of different strip map, spotlight, and scansar modes, and it acquires both horizontally and vertically polarized signals, as well as cross-polarized signals. The swath width ranges from 10 to 100 kilometers, with a resolution that varies between 1 and 16 meters, depending on the acquisition mode. Terrasar X has an 11-day repeat cycle and has been on operation since 2007. Since 2010, DLR has operated a twin satellite that operates in a tandem orbit with the original Terrasar X. These satellites operate in two different acquisition modes. The monostatic mode, where the two satellites are flying in sequence, enables a long track interferometry, which enables us to do both topographic mapping and fast surface motion mapping. The bi-static mode, where the two satellites are flying parallel to each other, enables high-resolution topographic mapping. And again, we will cover this a little bit more when we talk about INSAR in the next lesson. While Terrasar X scenes are norm not normally freely available, there are occasionally proposal calls from DLR to access images, and the global topographic products generated by Tandem X are freely available from DLR. The final SAR mission we'll look at is Sentinel-1, which we've already seen from the Week 3 practical. Sentinel-1 operates at 5.4 gigahertz, or 5.6 centimeters, making this another C-band radar, and you might be noticing a pattern here. It operates in both strip map and scan SAR modes, depending on where it is acquiring data. It acquires both horizontally and vertically polarized signals, with a swath width that varies between 20 and 400 kilometers, and a resolution that varies from 5 to 40 meters, depending, again, on the acquisition mode. Sentinel-1 has a 12-day repeat, though with multiple satellites, the actual repeat time is 6 days for most of the globe. The first satellite, Sentinel-1A, was launched in 2014, Sentinel-1B was launched in 2016, and both of these are still operational. While we currently have two satellites in orbit, there are plans to launch Sentinel-1C and Sentinel-1D in the not-too-distant future. Sentinel-1 data are freely available from a number of places. You can find them on the link shown here from Copernicus, but you can also search for them from the ASF archive that I linked earlier. As you have no doubt noticed in the Week 3 practical, downloading and processing your own SAR data is hard, and expensive, especially in terms of storage and computation. Now part of this is because SAR data files are huge and because they require various forms of geometric correction, which require a lot of processing. So one solution is to get HYPE, the ASF Hybrid Pluggable Processing Pipeline, or HYPE, provides free on-demand radiometric terrain correction, INSAR processing, and offset tracking products. All you have to do, all you have to do is order the images from Vertex, select, select the different kinds of processing that you want, and you can download your analysis-ready datasets once the processing is finished. If you are interested in working with SAR data sets, especially for your master's project, then I highly recommend that you look into this service. So, 
In this lesson, we've covered how, just like we've seen with other parts of the electromagnetic spectrum, we can define different microwave bands, which tend to have different applications due to the properties of the signal and how it interacts with Earth's surface. In general, SAR sensors acquire images in three main modes, depending on the application or the needs of the mission. Individual sensors will have more specific acquisition modes, so be sure to have a look at the documentation for the sensor that you're interested in using. We've seen how there are a number of freely available SAR datasets available, as well as free processing options. For example, the SNAP toolbox that we used in last week's practical, or the analysis-ready data via HYPE. I've included links to the mission pages for a number of SAR missions discussed here. We have ERS from the European Space Agency, the RadarSat Constellation mission from the Canadian Space Agency, PALSAR-2 from JAXA, TandemX from the uh, ESA EO portal directory, and Sentinel-1. There's also a link to this paper from Krieger et al. All that provides the details behind the TandemX mission. And finally, we have links to more information about HYPE, including a link to some information about the GIS analysis toolbox that they have put together. So that's all for this lesson. I hope you found it interesting, and if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to email me or post in the discussion forum on Blackboard. Bye!